When I Was a Little Girl by Zona Gale. This is Chapter 7, The Princess Romancia. That night, I could not go to sleep with the knowledge. If only I, as I am now, might have sat on the edge of the bed and told a story to me, as I was then. I'm always wishing that we two might have known each other, I as I am now, and I as I was then. We should have been so much more interested in each other than anybody else could ever be. I can picture us looking curiously at each other through the dark, and each would have wished to be the other. How hard we would have wished that. But neither of us would got it, as sometimes happens with wishes. Looking back on that night, knowing how much I wanted to be like the rest, I think this would be the story that I, as I am now, would have told that little me. Once upon a time, to the fairy king and queen, there was born a little daughter. And the king, being a modern fairy, determined to invite to the christening of his daughter twelve mortals, a thing never before contensed in in a fairy ceremony and of course all unreal people are always very particular about their ceremonies being just so it was a delicate and difficult task to make out that mortal invitation list for it was very hard to find in the world 12 human beings who at a fairy party would exactly fit in after long thought and consultation with all his ministers and counselors the king made out the following list a child a poet, a scientist, a carpenter, a prophet, an artist, an artisan, a gardener, a philosopher, a woman who was also a mother, a man who was also a father, and a day laborer. Do you think that will do it all? The fairy king asked the queen, tossing over the list. Well, dear, she replied, it's probably the best you can do. You know what people are. She hesitated a mere breath, a fairy's breath, and added, I do wonder a little, though, just why the day laborer. My dear, said the king, some day you will understand that and many other things as well. The christening room was a vasty hall whose deep blue ceiling was as high as the sky and as strange as the night. Lamps, dim as the stars, hung very high, and there was one silver central chandelier, globed like the moon, and there were frescoes like clouds. The furnishings of the vasty hall were most magnificent. There were pillars like trees spreading out into capitals of intricate and deep leafy design. Links of fair carpet ran here and there, as soft and shining as little streams. There were thick rugs as deep as moss, seats of native carved stone, and tapestries as splendid as vistas curtaining in the distance. And the music was like the music of all night, all done at once. To honor the occasion, the fairy guests had all come dressed as something else. For by now, of course, the fairies are copying many human fashions. One was disguised as a butterfly with her own wings prettily painted. One represented a rose, and she could hardly be distinguished from an American beauty. One was made up as a light whom nobody could recognize. One was a white moth, and one was a thistle down, and there were several fantastic toilettes, such as the great toe bow, a paper doll, and an hourglass. As for the human beings present, they all came masked as themselves, as usual, and their names I cannot give you, though sometimes I see someone with dreaming eyes whom I think I may have possibly have been one of one of those twelve for of course it must have made a difference in their looks ever afterward. It was a very brilliant assemblage indeed, and everyone was most intangible and elusive, which are fairy terms for well-behaved. While the guests were waiting for the fairy baby princess to be brought in, they idled about with that delightful going to be ice cream feeling you have at any party in some form or another, only you must never say so and they exchanged the usual pleasant nothing at alls. It is curious how very human-like nothings, very nothings are. For example, there is a great deal of night out about, 
said the butterfly fairy with a little shiver. If I were truly a butterfly, I should never be able to find my way home. And there is such a fad for thunder and lightning this season, added Paper Doll, Paper Doll Fairy agreeably. Do you remember, asked the white moth fairy, the night that we all dressed as white moths and went to meet the moon? We flew until we were all in the moonlight, and then we knew that we had met her. I wonder why more people did not meet meet the moon rise. Then someone observed that the wind that night was a pure soprano, and the guests amused themselves comparing wind notes, how on some nights the wind is deep bass, like a man's voice, raging through the world, and sometimes it is tenor, sweet and singing only serenades, and sometimes it is all contralto, and like a lullaby, and sometimes, but not often, it is like a heart music, like heart music being played on the trees. Suddenly, the whole dark lifted like a garment and moonlight flooded the vasty hall. And as if they had filtered down the air with the light, the fairy christening party entered, not as we enter a room by thresholds and steps, but the way that a thought comes into your head and you don't know how it got there. The christening party wore robes of colors that lie deep between the colors and may hardly be named. And in a secret ceremony, such as attends the blooming of flowers, the fairy baby was christened Romancia. Then the fairies brought her many offerings, and these have been received and admired. A great hush fell on the whole assembly, for now the twelve human beings came forward with their gifts, and everyone, except indeed the princess herself, was wild with curiosity to see what they had bought. No one left a card with any gift, but when the fairy king came to look them over afterward, he felt certain who had brought each one. The gifts were these, a little embroidered gown, which should make everyone love the princess while she wore it, a gazing crystal, which would enable the princess to see 100 times as much as anybody else saw, certain sea secrets and sea spells, a lyre which placed itself, a lyre which played itself, a flask containing a draught, which should seem to keep the princess young, a vial of colors which hardly anyone ever sees, flowers and grasses and leaves which could be used almost like a dictionary to spell out other things, an assortment of wonderful happy fancies of every variety, a new rainbow, a box of picture cards of the world, every one of which should come true if only one only went far enough, and a tapestry of the universe wrapped around a brand new idea in a box. When these things had been graciously accepted by the king, there was a stir in the company, and sweeping into its midst came another human being, one who thought that she had every right to be invited to the christening, but who had not been invited. All the fairies shrank back, for it was an extraordinary-looking human being. She was tall and lithe and wore a sparkling gown, and her face had the look of many cities, and now it was like the painted cover of an empty box, and all the time it had the meaning of only, only of those who never look at the stars, or walk in gardens, or think about others rather than themselves, or listen to hear what is right for them to do. This kind of human being is one who not often has any good gift to give anyone, and this the fairies knew. The vasty hall became very quiet to see what she had brought, for no one understood what she could possibly have to bestow on a baby. And without asking leave of the king or queen, she bent over the child and clasped on her wrist the tiniest bracelet that was ever made in the world. And she snapped its lock as fast as the lock on a fetter and held up the tiniest key that ever was wrought. The princess, she cried, shall seem different from everyone else. She shall, shall seem like nobody who has ever been. She shall, she shall seem like nobody who is or ever has been. As long as she wears her bracelet, this shall be true, and that she may never lose it. I shall hold her bracelet's key. Hail to this little princess child who shall seem like nobody in the world. Now no one present was quite certain what this might mean. 
but the lady's robe was so beautifully embroidered and sparkling and her voice was such a thing of loops and curves that nearly everyone accepted the gift as something fine after all and the queen gave her hand to kiss but the king who was a very wise fairy said nothing at all and merely bowed and eyed the bracelet in deep thought his me his mediate his meditation was interrupted by a most awkward incident in the excitement of the bestowal of gifts by by the human beings and the confusion of the entrance of the thirteenth and uninvited human being one of them all had been forgotten and had gotten himself shuffled well back to the back of everyone and now he became press and now he came pressing forward in great embarrassment to bring his gift it was the day laborer and several of the human beings drew hastily back as he approached the, de the dais. But everyone fell still farther back in consternation when it was seen what he had brought. For on the delicate cobweb coverlet of the little princess's bed, he cast a spadeful of dirt. It's all I've got, the man said, or I'd brought better. The earth all but covered the little bed of the princess, and it was necessary to lift her from it which the fairy queen did with her own hands, flashing a reproachful glance at her husband, the king. But when the party had trooped away for the dancing, with the orchestra playing the way a summer night would sound if it were to steep itself in music, so that it could only be heard and not seen, the king came quietly back to the christening chamber and ordered the spadeful of dirt to be gathered up and put in a certain part of the palace garden. And so, the human beings, having gone home at once and forgotten that they had been present, when the music lessened to silence and the fairy stole from note to note and at last drifted away as invisibly as the hours leave a dial, they passed in the palace garden a great corner of the rich black dirt which the day laborer had brought to the princess, and it was ready for seed sowing. The Princess Romancia grew with the days and the years, and from the first it was easily to be seen that certainly she seemed different from everyone in the world. As a baby, she began talking in her cradle without having been taught, not very plainly, to be sure, or so that anybody in particular excepting the fairy queen understood her, but still she talked. As a little girl, she seemed always to be listening to things as if she understood them as well as she did people, or better. When she grew older, nobody knew quite how she differed, but everybody agreed that she seemed different. And this the princess knew better than anybody, and most of the time it made her hurt all over. When the fairies played the thistle-down ball, the princess often played too, but she never felt really like one of them at all. She felt that they were obliged to have her play with them because she was the princess, and not because they wanted her. When they played a hide-and-go-seek in the flower bed, Somehow the others always hid together in the big flowers, and the princess hid alone in a tulip or a poppy. And whenever they whispered among themselves, she always fancied that they were whispering of her. She imagined herself often looked at with a smile or a shrug. She began to believe that she was not wanted, but only endured because she was the princess. And she was certain that no one liked her for herself alone, because she was somehow so different. Little by little, she grew silent and refused to join the, in the games and sat apart alone. Presently, she began to give blunt answers and to take exception and even to disagree. And of course, little by little, the court began secretly to dislike her and to cease to try to understand her. And they told one another that she was hopelessly different and that was that different and that that was all there was to be said about her but in spite of all this the princess romancia was very beautiful and the fame of her beauty went over the whole fairy land when enough years had gone by fairy princess from this and that dominion began to come to the king's palace to see her but though they all admired the princess great beauty many were of course repelled by her sharp answers her sharp answers and constant suspicions. But at last the news of the princess' beauty and strangeness reached the farthest border of fairyland and came to the ears of young Prince Hesperus. Now Prince Hesperus, who was the darling of his father's court 
and beloved of everybody was tired of everybody. Every fairy is like every other fairy, he was often heard saying wearily. I do wish I could find somebody with a few new ways. One would think fairies were all cut from the same pattern. Therefore, when word came to him of strange and beautiful Princess Romancia, who was believed to be different from everyone else in the world, you can imagine with what haste he made ready to set out for her father's palace. Princess Hesperus arrived at the palace at twilight, when the king's garden was wrapped in the shadow light, which no one can step through, if he looks without feeling somewhat like a fairy himself and glad to be one. He sent his servants on ahead, folded his wings, and proceeded on foot through the silent gardens. And in a little arbor made of fallen petals, renewed each day, he came on Princess Romancia asleep. He, of course, did not recognize her, but never since for him the world began had the prince seen anyone so beautiful. His step roused her, and she sprang to her feet, and as soon as he looked at her, Prince Hesperus found himself wanting to tell her of what he had just been thinking, and before he knew it, he was doing so. I've just been thinking, he said, what a delightful pet a leaf shadow would make if one could catch it and tame it. I wonder if one could do it. Think how it would dance for one all day long. The Princess Romancia stared a little. But when the sun went down, she was surprised into saying the shadow would be dead. Not at all, the prince replied. It would only be asleep and it would never have to be fed, and it could live in one's palace. I would like such a pet, said the princess thoughtfully. If I may walk with you, said the prince, we will talk more about it. They walked together toward the palace and talked more about it, so that the princess Romancia quite forgot to be more different than she was, and the prince forgot all about everything save his companion. And when he saw about her all the gifts of tenderness and vision and magic, of sea secrets and sea spells, of music and colors and knowledge and charming notions which the human beings had brought her at her birth, though these hardly ever were visible because the princess seemed so different from everybody else. And when as they drew near the palace, their servants came hastening to escort them, the two looked at each other in the great surprise to find out they were prince and prince, princess for all other things had seemed so much more important. Their formal meeting took place that evening in the Vasti Hall, where years before the princess had been christened. Prince Hesperus was filled with the most joyous anticipation and awaited his presentation to the princess with the feeling that fairyland was just beginning. But the princess, on the other hand, was no sooner back in her palace among her ladies than the curse of her terrible christening present descended upon her as she had never felt it before. How, the poor princess thought, could the prince possibly like her, who was so different from everybody in the world? While she was being dressed, every time that her ladies spoke in a low tone, she imagined they were speaking of her. Every time that one smiled and shook her head, the princess was certain that it was in pity of her. She fancied that they knew that her walk was awkward, her voice harsh, her robe in bad taste, and an old fear came upon her that the palace mirrors had all been changed to conceal from her that she was really very ugly. In short, by the time she was expected to descend, poor Princess Romancia had made herself utterly miserable. Therefore, when in her gown of fresh cobweb, the princess entered the hall and the prince hastened eagerly forward, she hardly looked at him. And when at the banquet that followed, he sat beside her and tried to continue the talk of the arbor and the walk, she barely, she barely replied at all. How beautiful you are, he murmured. So is the night, said the princess, and you do not tell the night that it is beautiful. Your eyes are like stars, the prince said. There are real stars above, said the princess. You are like no one else, cried the prince. At least you need not charge me with that, said the poor princess. Nor would she dance with him or with anyone else, for she imagined that they did not wish to dance with her, and that her dancing was worse than anyone's. 
and as soon as she was able and long before cock crow she slipped away from them all and went to sleep in a handy cro crocus cup now at all this the king and queen were nearly as distressed as the prince and they were obliged to tell prince hesperus the whole story of the christening when he heard about the uninvited human being who had given the baby princess this dreadful present and had kept the key to the bracelet which was its bond he sprang up and grasped his tiny sword i will go out in the world and find this human being he cried and i will bring back the bracelet key without again seeing the princess prince hesperus left the palace and fared forth on his quest and when she found that he was gone, she was more wretched than ever before, for in her life no one had ever talked to her as he had talked, speaking his inmost fancies, and when she had lost him, she wanted more than ever to talk with him. But the king, who was a very wise fairy, did not tell her where the prince had gone. And now the princess Romancia did not know what to do with herself. The court was unbearable. All her trivial occupations bored her and the whole world seemed to have been made different from all other worlds. Worse to endure was the presence of her companions, who all seemed to love and to understand one another, while she only was alone and out of their sympathy. Oh, she cried, if only I had a game or a task to do with somebody or something that didn't know I am different, that wouldn't know who I am. And she thought longingly, of the prince's fancy about the leaf shadow for a pet which should dance with one all day long a leaf shadow would not know that i am not like everybody else the poor princess thought one night when a fairy ring had been formed in an open grassy space among old oaks the princess could bear it all no longer when the music was at its merriest and a band of strolling goblin musicians were playing their maddest she slipped away and returned to the palace by an unfrequented path and entered a long disused part of the garden and there in a corner where she had never walked before she came upon a great place of rich black earth which in the sweet spring air lay ready for sowing it was the spadeful of earth which the day labor had brought to her christening and there for all these years the king had caused it to remain untouched its own rank weed growth enriching the richness until but a touch would now turn it into a fruitage and seeing it so and being filled with her wish for something which would take her thought away from herself and from her difference from all the world the princess romancia was instantly minded to make a garden night being the work time and playtime of the fairies the princess went at once to the palace granaries and selected seeds of many kinds, flower and vegetable and fern seeds. And she brought them to this corner of a rich earth and she planted them under the moon. She would call no servants to help her, fearing lest they would smile amongst themselves at her strange doing. All night she worked at the planting and when morning came, she fell asleep in a mandrake blossom and woke hungry for a breakfast of honeydew and thinking of nothing save getting back to her new garden. The wind helped her, and as the days passed, the sun and the rain helped her, and she used certain magic which she knew, so that pre presently her garden was a glory. Poppies and corn, beans and berries, green peas and sweet peas, pinks and potatoes, celery and white phlox, melons and cardinal flowers, all these grew wonderfully together, as it were, hand in hand, as they will grow for fairy folk, and in such great luxuriance that the princess wrought early and late to keep them ordered and watered she would have no servants to help her for she grew more and more to love her task for here at last in her garden she had found them those whom she could not imagine to be smiling among themselves at anything she said or did but all the green things responded to her hands like friends answering to a hand class and when the flowers nodded to one another this meant only that a company of little leaf shadows were set dancing on the earth, almost as if they had been tamed to be her pets, according to the princess's fancy. 
Up at the palace, the queen and the ladies in waiting to the queen and the princess regarded all this as but another sign of poor Romancia's strangeness. From her tower window, the queen peered anxiously down at her daughter toiling away at sunrise. Now she's raising carrots and beets, cried the queen, wringing her hand. She grows more different from us every moment of her life. She seems to do so, admitted the king, but he was very wise. And let her be, he commanded everybody. We may see what all this means and a great many other things as well. Meanwhile, Prince Hesperus, journeying from land to land and from height to valley, was seeking in vain for the one person who, as he thought, could remove from the princess the curse of her indifference from all the rest of the world. And it was very strange how love had changed him. For now, instead of his silly complaint that every fairy is like every other fairy, and his silly longing for a different pattern in fairies, he sought only for the charm which should make his beloved princess like everybody else. Where should he find this terrible human being, this uninvited one who held the key to the princess's bracelet? that was so like a fetter. He went first to the town nearest to Fairyland, the people of the town having no idea how near to Fairyland they really were, were going prosaically about their occupations. And though they could have looked up into the magic garden itself, they remained serenely indifferent. There he found the mother who had been at the christening of the princess and alighting close to a great test that she was doing for the whole world. He tried to ask her who it was who makes folk different from all the rest. He tried to ask her who it was who makes folk different from all the rest, but she could not hear his tiny, tiny voice, which came to her merely as a thought about something which could not possibly be true. In a pleasant valley, he came on that one who, at the christening, had brought the lyre, which played of itself. But when the prince asked him his question, he fancied it to be merely the wandering of his own melody, with a note about something new to his thought. The poet by the stream singing of the brotherhood of man, the prophet on a mountain foreseeing the brotherhood as in a gazing crystal, the scientist weaving the brotherhood in a tapestry of the universe. None of these knew anyone who could possibly make folk different from everybody else, nor did any of the others on whom the Prince Hesperus chanced. When one day he thought that he had found her, because he met one whose face had the look of many cities and was like the painted cover of an empty box. Straightway he saw another and another, and still others, men and women both, who were like her, with only the meaning of those who never look at the stars or walk in gardens or think about others rather than themselves, or listen to hear what is right for them to do. And then he saw that these are many and many who believe themselves to be different from everybody else and to try to make others so. And he saw that it would be useless to look further among them for that one who had the key for which he sought. So at last, Prince Hesperus returned sadly back toward the palace of the princess. Alas, said the prince, it is for her own happiness that I seek to have her like other people. For my, myself, I would love to have her anyway. But yet what am I to do? For she seems so different that she will never believe that I love her. It was already late at night when the prince found himself in the neighborhood of the palace. And being tired and travel worn, he resolved to take shelter in the cup of some flour and wait until the palace revelries were done. Accordingly, he entered the garden of a humble cottage and crept within the petals of a wild lily growing in the long, untended grass. He had hardly settled himself to sleep when he heard from the cottage the sound of bitter crying. Now this is a sound which no fairy will ever pass by or ever so much as hear without trying to comfort. And at once, Prince Hesperus rose and flew to the sill of the open lattice. He looked in on a poor room with the mean, meanest furnishings. On a comfortless bed lay the father of the house, ill and helpless. His wife sat by his side, 
and the children clung about her, crying with hunger and mingling their tears with her own. The man turned and looked at her, making a motion to speak, and Protesperus flew into the room and alighted on the handle of a great spade covered with earth, which stood in a corner. Wife, the man said, I brought you little but sorrow and hunger. I would have brought you more if I had better, and now I see you starve. I am not too hungry, the wife said, but the children sobbed. Princess Perez waited not a moment. He flew into the night and away toward the palace, and missing the fairy ring where among old oaks the fairies were dancing, he reached the palace by an unfrequented path and entered a disused part of the palace garden. And there in a corner which he had never visited, Princess Perez saw a marvelous mass of bloom and fruit, poppies and corn, beans and berries, green peas and sweet peas, pinks and potatoes, celery and white phlox, melons and cardinal flowers, all growing wonderfully together, as it were, hand in hand. And above them, in a moonflower clinging to the wall, sat the Princess Romancia, rocking in the wind and brooding upon her garden. Come, cried Prince Hesperus. There is a thing to do. The princess looked at him a little fearfully, but he paid almost no attention to her, so absorbed he was in what he wished to have done. Hard by is a family, said the prince, dying of hunger. Here is food. Hail in these idlers dancing in the light of the moon, and let us carry the family the means to stay alive. Without a word, the princess went with him, and they appeared together in the fairy wing and held away the dancers. And when these understood the need, they all joined together, fairies, goblin musicians, and all, and hurried away to the garden of the princess. They wove a litter of sweet stems, and into this they piled all the food of the princess's tending. And when the queen would have them send to the palace kitchen for supplies, the king, who was a wise fairy, would not permit it, and commanded that all should be done as the prince wished. So when the garden was ravished of its sweets, they all bore them away, and trooped to the cottage, and cast them on the threshold. And then they perched about the room, or hovered in the path of the moonlight to hear what should be said. And Prince Hesperus and Princess Romancia listened together upon the handle of the poor man's spade. At sight of the gifts, the wife sprang up joyfully and cried out to her husband, and the children wakened with happy shouts. Here is food, food, they cried. Oh, it must be from the fairies. The sick man looked and smiled. Ay, he said. The little folk have remember, remembered us. They have brought us rich, in, us rich store in return for my poor spade full of earth. Then the prince and princess and all of the court understood that this poor man whom they had helped was that very day laborer who had come to the christening of the princess. And swift as a moonbeam, and not unlike one, Prince Hesperus darted from beside the princess and alighted on the man's pillow. Ah, he cried. Can you not then tell me who it is who put, who has the power to make one different from everybody else in the world? In half delirium, the day laborer heard the voice of the prince and caught the question. But he did not know that it was the voice of the prince, and he fancied it to be the voice of the whole world, as it were throbbing with the prince's question. And he cried out loudly in answer, No one has that power. No one is different. Those who seem different hold no truth. We are all alike, all of us that live. Swiftly the prince turned to the king and the queen and the court. The uninvited human being, he cried. Did she say that the princess should be different from all the other world? Or that she should merely seem different? The queen and court could not remember. But the king, who was a wise fairy, instantly remembered. She said that she should seem different, he said. Then the prince laughed out joyfully. Ay, he cried, seem different indeed. There are many and many who may do that, but this man speaks truth, and out of his spadeful of earth we have learned it. We are all alike, all of us who live. With that he grasped his tiny sword, 
and flew to the side of the princess and lifted her hand in his. And with a swift, deft stroke, he cut from her wrist the bracelet that was like a fetter and took her in his arms. Ah, my princess, he cried, you have seemed different from us all only because you would have it so. The princess Romancia looked around on the court and suddenly she saw only the friendliest, the friendliness which had always been there if she could have believed. She looked on her father and mother, the king and the queen, and she saw only tenderness. She looked on the day laborer and his family and understood that, fairy and princess though she was, she was like them, and they were like her. Last, she looked in the face of the prince, and she did not look away. Invisibly, as the hours leave a, on, leave a dial, the fairies drifted from the little room and back to the fairy ring among the old oaks to dance for very joyousness. The laborer and his family, hearing them go, were conscious of a faint lifting of the dark, as if morning were coming, bringing a new day. And to the Princess Romancia, beside Prince Hesperus, the world itself was a new world, where she did not walk alone as she had thought, but where all folk who will have it so walk together.